Thanks, Luigi. Um, so I, I suppose this talk is about ARDS and what is ARDS and what isn't. Uh, majority of people referred up to the SRF have ARDS, and some obviously have a relatively clear cause. They have pancreatitis, meningococcal sepsis, or been run over by a bus. But a lot don't. And a lot of those who don't have a clear cause are labelled as having ARDS secondary to pneumonia. And of course, some of those who are labelled such actually do have pneumonia. This is a severe Legionella pneumonia. It's got the gradient from front to back, black at the front, white at the bottom. This is a pneumococcal sepsis, again, ECMO dependent. Uh, and again, the gradient, black at the front, white at the back. Um, and they get better with treatment of their underlying pathology. But of course, not everything labelled as pneumonia and bad ARDS is, is actually such. And of course, if you think you're treating something which you're not treating, uh, it's not going to get better. Um, and this is a series of four or five cases of things which look like a ARDS but which are not. I'm not sure what to call them. I, I suppose I'll just call them AR ARDS mimics or ARDS plus. The first one's relatively straightforward. She's a 21-year-old female. Uh, she presents with three months of being unwell with arthralgias uh, and malaise, and then three weeks of cough, fever, and hemoxis. Um, going to a GP every Friday for three weeks, and after the third visit, he sent her in just in time. So she got admitted on Friday. She's got bilateral infiltrates. Uh, and as always, or as is often the case, she was diagnosed with an atypical pneumonia because she had diffuse infiltrates. Um, and whenever I see atypical pneumonia, I, I think that's, a, you, you gotta, that's got to ring uh, alarm bells. By Saturday, she was intubated. By Sunday, she was more or less unventilatable with refractory hypoxia and, um, a, and uh, respiratory acidosis. Um, here's her ECMO retrieval film that the pipes are in. And you can see that the only air in her, in her body is in her, is in her colon. Um, and here's her... CT, so it's, it's virtually um, uninterpretable. I suppose this could be termed the baby lung. <laughs> yeah. um, I don't know what its compliance is, but uh, anyway. So, so what is this? Well, it, it, this is pretty straightforward. I mean, the, the, the clues are the hemoxis, obviously, the low hemoglobin. But I, I find anybody who comes in with severe respiratory failure tends to have a low hemoglobin. But her hemoglobin was low at eight. Uh, it, to me, it's more the prodrome. It's the arthralgias and the fatigue over three months, which suggests there's something else going on. Uh, and then there's exquisite single organ failure. I think you can get to this from a staph pneumonia or from a pneumococcal pneumonia, but if you want to get that bad, you've got to have a degree of multi-organ failure and you've got to be on a bit of vasopressors to fall. She was on no vasopressors and her kidneys were fine. And she had no multi-organ failure. So it, it's clear that there, there was something else going on and you know, it's not that difficult. She's coughing up blood. Um, and I think it's very important to send off the anchor of course, you send it off. It takes about four or five days because they batch it and they run it and blah blah blah, blah and it comes back too late. So I think if you want it back, you have to press for it to come back. And, and we can turn the anchor around in about four hours. And so by about three o'clock, we got her as being P-anchor positive. And of course, you then want to know what that anchor is. And indeed, she was MPO positive with myeloperoxidase, uh, and that's associated with microscopic polyarteritis. So this is one of the anchor-associated vasculitis, uh, vas vasculitis disease um, leading to a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And because it's MPO positive, we can call it microscopic polyarteritis, which, of course, is just a sibling of, of, of vagueness, which we now have to call GPA. But anyway, it's an anchor-associated vasculitis, and it's giving it a diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Uh, and this is how she was managed. The important thing is, if you don't manage it like this, they're not going to, well, they'll die. Uh, so they need aggressive immunosuppression. She was young, uh, in her 20s, so we gave her a rituximab-based regimen, and uh, it, it starts off with three grams of methylprednisolone. We then use a plasma exchange for three or four days until they stop bleeding, and then you nip in with a rituximab. You have to wait 48 hours for the rituximab to bind, so rituximab anti-CD20 binds to B cells, stops the antibody production. Um, but if you plex them immediately afterwards, all the rituximab ends up in the pot, and it's quite expensive stuff. Anyway, once you've once it's bound, then you complete the plasma exchange, and then she gets the, uh, the second of four doses of rituximab. And here she is. She comes in with no end tidal CO2. Uh, she gets no tidal volumes here. And then she breaks around here on the sixth day, on the fifth of um, whatever this was. Uh, and, and she breaks to 500 mils of, of tidal volume. Uh, and she's off ECMO uh, on day seven. And she's extubated by day 10 and back to Great Yarmouth on, um, in air on the 15th. Um, and, that, and that's uh, walking into clinic 
um, uh, uh, about three weeks later. And, you know, and she's 21, and she's absolutely fine. Um, and I suppose the interesting thing about this, and the interesting thing about treating people with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage associated with anchor and associated vasculitides with ECMO, it's a completely different game to what it used to be like um, five or six years ago. Here's a CRP graph. It starts up at 225. This is the, um, the immunosuppression going in on ECMO, and this is a little bounce you get in CRP um, after she's decannulated. We've got, we've got six now. They all do the same thing. This is a the CRP of, of, of anchor associated vasculitides treated with ECMO. And you can see they start off very inflammatory, they drop, they stay down, and they are out of the woods by day 14. And they all have done amazingly well. They're left without any respiratory compromise. They all have virtually normal X-rays. Um, here are eight historical controls. Uh, and you can see we can get the alveolar hemorrhage under control, the CRP drops, but then there is just mayhem. And this mayhem just go, this is this is just three three weeks. It just goes on for a protracted period, and they're left with sort of fibroproliferative ARDS. Um, and of these, two died. Um, so there are eight in this group. Two died. Four were left with um, a degree of quite moderate, to, at least moderate to severe chronic respiratory impairment. Uh, and two, we don't know what happened to. So it's it, in my mind, it's completely changed the way we deal with um, anchor associated vasculitis with diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. I think part of it is it allows the, the lung to rest, and yet in the olden days we could, we could treat the diffuse alveolar hemorrhage, but in order to keep them alive we had to oscillate them and bang them away, and I think that just damaged the lungs, and those lungs are already inflammatory because they're sitting in you know, that vasculitic um, milieu. Um, so, I, I, so my, my, my policy in the future is, is to put them on ECMO earlier. I mean, Luigi may not agree with that, but I, I, I don't think it is anti antiplatelet. So th th those are the AAV-associated DAHs, and they're pretty straightforward. And there are a whole group of people who can be misinterpreted as being pneumonia and, and ARDS. Uh, this is the second group, and he's, um, uh, he's 22. Um, and the story was that he had asthma when he was 14. Uh, he only had one episode of asthma, and that put him in ICU. Uh, and his mum was told that it was special asthma because when the doctors listened to his chest, they couldn't hear any, uh, any wheeze. Uh, and, then they, and, then, and then they let him go, and then, and then he was fine for eight years. No inhalers, nothing. Okay? Doesn't really sound like asthma. And then he gets a job in a bar, gets some money, and then he starts smoking quite a lot. And then two weeks after starting smoking, he starts coughing up green sputum, and he gets fever, and he gets sweats. And he comes in, he's all hot and bothered, so his CRP is up at 300. He's got a white count of 30, all neutrophils, and he's got, a, he's got a temperature. And he's got this X-ray. And again, you go back, it's reported as an atypical pneumonia um, with a bit of asthma. But you know, he's got bilateral infiltrates, he's got bilateral effusions. It doesn't really look like an asthma in a 22-year-old. Anyway, this is the 4th of um, July. Uh, this is the next day at 11 o'clock, and of course now he's in trouble. Uh, he's got bilateral infiltrates, and then uh, an hour and a half later he's again unventilatable um, like that, and gets retrieved on ECMO with no gas in any sort of useful area. Um, and then here it is. So his eosinophils, which were started out as being just upper limit of normal, just pop up uh, and hit five. Um, and this is the other group or one of the other groups of ARDS mimics, and, and this is acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, and he was treated with uh, methylprednisolone, just a gram a day for three days, and then to a milligram per kilogram. And, he, and this is him two days later. And, and they're just great to treat, as you probably know. They, they get bad very quickly, but they just get, they get a lot better very, very quickly as well. Um, and here is, he, he walked back into clinic, uh, um, that's on the 18th of August, so... Um, you know, about sort of six weeks after his pretty catastrophic presentation. Um, his eosinophils are interesting. Th this, is, this, is, this, is, this is them going up. This is the methylprednisolone, three grams going in. And then he goes on to uh, 60 milligrams per kilo of, oh, one milligram per kilogram is quite a big guy, so it's about 80 milligrams of prednisolone orally. And his, his eosinophils just laugh at that. Like they just go straight up again. And I think his eosinophils are, are a little odd. But they certainly came back down again with a bit more IV methylprednisone, and they've stayed down, apart from that little blip there. And so this is an acute eosinophilic pneumonia. It, remember, it presents with fever, 
a white count, and when it first starts, it's all neutrophilia and the raised CRP. So it looks just like, an, uh, like a you know, barn door, nasty, fast-moving uh, bacterial pneumonia. There is the rapid progression, so they're usually in intensive care within 48 hours, and then the eosinophils go up. But again, although they can be a little bit norad-dependent and a little bit dilated, they're not in that sort of very high noradrenaline septic shock state that you'd expect if somebody went from virtually normal to, um, to requiring um, intubation within 48 hours. And I think you've got to worry about anybody with that presentation. If they come in within 48 hours, they're, 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 they're ventilated. Um, and remember, there shouldn't be any eosinophils in a rip-roaring pneumonia. They should be all suppressed by endogenous steroids. Um, and the other thing to say is, you know, we call this a, acute eosinophilic pneumonia, but I, I think the eos, primary eosinophilias are, are a spectrum. And acute eosinophilic pneumonia is supposed to be a monophasic illness, but it so frequently isn't. It'll morph and it'll change, you know, get other, other organs involved, gut involvement, skin involvement, and then you can call it an HES, or it can be in the background of um, sort of cardiomyopathy and, and asthma, and you can call it EGPA, you know, what we used to call Churg Strauss. And the interesting about him, this guy, was we, we all went from the SRF meeting and pootled over and we were just muttering about eosinophil this and eosinophil that. And, and, he, and his mum goes, oh, eosinophils. Um, she was sitting by the bed. He said, that's what my dad's got. And his granddad's got an eosinophilic um, uh, enteritis, I think. Um, and the interesting thing I thought about that is because there's, there's this, there, is these, there are these lymphocytic um, uh, hyperosinophilic syndromes and they're all X-linked. And as you probably know, there's that PDGRF, F1N1 like peptide fusion uh, mutation, which gives you this. And it skips females and appears in the male. So we tested him for that, and of course it was negative. <laughs> but it, but, but, but it, yeah, he's just got another one, which the haematologists haven't, um, haven't uh, defined yet. So that's the acute eosinophilic pneumonia. Um, and then this one is sort of the third, the third group. Um, and she's 57, she's female, she's non-white. Uh, and she presents with six months of joint and wrist pain. This is buried, though, in the history. This isn't apparent to begin with. And sort of proximal myalgias if you, if you push her relatives. Uh, and then she gets six weeks of cough, fevers, and progressive shortness of breath. Goes to a GP and has lots and lots of antibiotics, which don't work. And comes in on the 6th of January this year with a CRP of 200 and this X-ray. Again, yeah, it was interpreted as, a, as an atypical pneumonia. And they, they call it an atypical pneumonia because it's a bilateral change and, you know, what is it? I mean, it could be PCP, but it wasn't. She's HIV negative. So here's on the 6th of January. So again, she gets treated with lots and lots of antibiotics. And two weeks in, she's in a bit of a pickle because now she's 16 days in here. She's got a CRP of 410 and she's intubated um, and comes over just maintaining her, her, her oxygenation on sort of conventional ventilation. Um, and here's her CT. Um, and all, this, all this sort of extrapulmonary, intrapulmonary stuff, I, I don't really get that. But what it, for, for me, this is not the black at the front, white at the bottom thing. This is, is, is black at the top, but there are little spared secondary pulmonary lobules at the base. You can see here and here and here. And this, to me, is a perilobular pattern. And when you see that, that's highly suggestive of an organizing pneumonia going into an acute interstitial pneumonitis pattern. And you can get that, you see this a lot in flu, particularly flu A looks like this. But if it's not flu, you've got to wor worry about it being an inflammatory organizing pneumonia going into an AIP. Um, and the commonest thing which does this is all the antithintetase syndromes, like the JO1s, the PL7s, and the TIFs. And they're associated with an underlying dermatomyositis, and specifically with the antisynthetases, they get this very aggressive, fast-moving organizing pneumonia. So you know you've got the cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, it's normally blown away with a bit of steroids. These, these are different. They're, they're much more muscular diseases, and they go from an OP into an AIP, and they are resistant to treatment. And if you leave them, they become resistant to all treatment and lead to death. Um, so, recognising that, we, we sent off all, of, all, of, all the serology, so we sent off lots of serology, and I'll show you that at the end. Um, but we s treated it with a gram of three grams of methylprednisolone and went in with a large dose of cyclophosphamide. A lot of people use that, that um, Eurolupus dose of 500 milligrams. I don't think that cuts the mustard 
in, in this set of diseases. So this was 1.2 grams of cyclophosphamide. And she had this dramatic response. So here's a CRP fall down to here. Um, so this is, a, this is a period of maximum happiness with everybody. Uh, so this is about sort of day four or five of post-cyclo. And then, and you can see her lungs get a lot better, but then her belly blows up. Uh, and this is at, this, is, this really was at day nine of post-cyclo, so right in the middle of a Nadia count. Um, and she's got, um, uh, and with that her CRP jumps, and she's got um, a dead gut. Um, well, she had a lot of dead gut. And of course I thought, oh dear, that's not very good. But um, so they, they, they took her to theatre, chopped it all out. Um, and uh, that, that's period of maximum unhappiness, and you know, they're very good. Uh, and uh, here she is, she, she sailed through and she's absolutely fine. Um, and this was, I think, just before, this was on uh, sort of a couple of weeks in. And here she's in clinic, she came up to clinic um, uh, on Tuesday and she's, um, she's fine. She's gonna go and have a reversal of her stoma. So again, the, it's the antisynthase group of OPs going into an AIP. Now you probably can't see all this, but just to take you through all the serology, which I, I personally think everybody ought to have, um, you know, day or night, on, it's, it's, about, it's worth, it costs about sort of an hour on ICU or about five minutes on ECMO in, in, in financial terms. So we send off an ANA and an ENA. Okay, so the ANA is a screening test. The ENA looks for all the extractable nuclear agents. And look at her, she's a negative ANA and she's a negative ENA. Okay. The important thing is you've got to send off this myositis specific ENA. And that's where the money is. And she's PL12 positive. And that, that buys it. Okay. That's highly specific if it is a true positive in the correct setting for an antisynthetase syndrome. If you don't send off the ENA, the uh, myosp myositis specific ENA, you'll miss these and they will die and they will get labelled as pneumonia and ARDS. And it's not pneumonia and ARDS and they are reversible. Um, the other uh, catch is they quite frequently present with, with joint pains and they quite frequently have a positive rheumatoid factor and they're quite frequently mislabeled as rheumatoid arthritis. And there's this myth that rheumatoid arthritis is associated with nasty organizing pneumonias. I don't think it is. I, I, I see a lot of rheumatoid arthritis, a lot of lung disease, and, and, it, and it's not organizing pneumonia. I think those people are, 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 are misreading um, uh, antithetase syndrome with arthralgias. Anyway, the, 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 the key is um, to, to, to look for it if you get that patchy pattern and it's not, uh, and it's not flu. Um, Often they're clinically amyopathic, so they don't have muscle aches, and they may just have a, just a slight sort of elevation in their CK, or no elevation in their CK. They often have a positive rheumatoid factor, and don't be fooled by a negative ANA and negative ENA, and remember the MSA pattern. The most important thing is to go back and take the history, and it's, all, it's always there. It's the, the malaise, the fatigue, the joint pains, often the rash, and then often they get Gottron's papules over their knuckles and their elbows. Um, yeah, I just said that. Um, oh, and the other thing is um, they present with progressive single organ failure. Um, and they're the ones, you know, you get the hand over, oh, he's fine. Yeah, yeah, he's just, he's slowly getting better. And you go and see them and they're just reading the newspaper on CPAP, you know, on 60 or 70%. You think, well, that's not right. Why is he, why is it just the lungs? Why isn't it everything else? Why hasn't he fallen apart elsewhere? So it's just progressive single organ failure. And if you just give them meat garam methyl pred, they'll get a little bit better and they get worse again. Um, so the immunosuppression for this bunch has to be early and adequate, and they need a lot of stuff. Um, and we usually give them either methyl pred and cyclophosphamide and rituximab plus or minus plasma exchange. And they're slower to turn around than the AAV DAH group and the acute eosinophilic pneumonias. These, these people are gratifying and they get better quickly. These people, you have to wait. Um, you know, sometimes two, three weeks, but you can pull them out if you get on top of them early. So that's the, the first three groups. That's the AAV, uh, DAHs, the eosinophilic lung diseases, and the, um, and the antisynthetase syndromes. And along with the antisynthetase syndromes, there are all the CTD-associated ILDs, um, the systemic sclerosis ILDs. Um, and this is to show that sometimes it gets a little tricky. This is, I think, the most interesting, or the most, <coughs> one of the most difficult we had last year. She's 23, she's previously well, and she just presents with a month of just progressive coughing up of blood and progressing, progressive dyspnea, and nothing else. No malaise, no joint pains, nothing. So she goes in locally, has this x-ray, is labeled again as, a, as an atypical pneumonia, gets given some antibiotics, 
Two days later, she's on intensive care and she's got blood coming up her ET tube. And her local physicians very understandably and correctly say, you've got an AAV associated DAH. They send off the um, anchor, they send off the anti-GBM uh, and they give her three grams of methylprednisolone. Great. And uh, here she is three days after admission uh, and she's better. Okay. She's down to 40%. She can go to the scanner and she, has a, she couldn't go to the scanner beforehand because she was, um, I think, a little bit unwell. Uh, from, just from a lungs point of view. And you can see, that it, this, this is the picture to my eye of blood. So if you look at a CT and you can think, if I would look up in the sky and see that, would it look like a cloud? And it kind of does look a, like a cloudy sky, doesn't it? And it also spares the edges. Um, and that sort of cloud-like appearance and sparing the edges is very characteristic of blood. Now, it could be anything else, but they knew that there was blood coming up the tube and she had had lots of hemoptysis, so it wasn't that difficult to suggest that this was diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. And so everything was looking good. Um, and this is five days post-admission. Things are improving. She's on about 40%. And then, and then all the results come back. And, and the anchors are negative. And, and the anti-GBMs are negative. And you can't really have an anchor-associated uh, DAH with a negative anchor. It's, you can, but it's, it's real unusual. And you can't really have... Well, they believe that you couldn't have good pastures without, with a negative anti-GBM. And they were seen by, he was seen by, she was seen by rheumatology, and they said it's probably not vasculitis. And I don't think it wasn't a vasculitis because it didn't have any feet. The only thing was the bleeding into the lungs. There's, there's no other vasculitic features. And she was cold. Um, so they said, okay, carry on with the broad spectrum antibiotics. She's on the mend, and just hold her with a stress dose of um, hydrocortisone, you know, 8 milligrams a, watch maybe, so 200 milligrams. So that's about 50 of pred a day. Unfortunately, she got worse. So this is um, uh, uh, three or four days later. And then this is uh, two weeks into the mission. She starts bleeding again. She gets new bilateral infiltrates uh, and gets retrieved on, on ECMO. Um, and again, you know, you could say this is ARDS. Um, I suppose it is ARDS, except it's, 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 it's blood. She's got a gradient, which is a little bit odd for, for alveolar hemorrhage. Um, and although it looks a bit cloud-like and it does spare the edges, it, it, it's... it's it looks a bit like blood, but it could also be due to you know, widespread endobronchial infection. Um, and I, did find, we, I think we found this a little bit difficult. She was antibody negative. She deteriorated despite pretty aggressive immunosuppression, although she was now two weeks out of her initial methylprednisolone. There's no positive micro apart from this scanty candida. Um, but the history was clear. You spoke, spoke to her, uh, her parents. She, she had this hemoptysis, and she'd gone to a festival, and she'd smoked more at the festival, music festival than she had normally, and, and then the, the, she, the hemoptysis had got worse. And again, she was in single organ failure, just exquisite single organ failure. Um, and so we sort of, sort of made this up, although it is reported. It's always called it antibody-negative anti-GBM disease. On the basis of, she did have hemoptysis, she did have hematuria. If you went back, there was a couple of dipsticks which were positive, you know, on catheter specimens, uh, and the absence of any systemic features. And the key thing about good pastures, we couldn't ask her because she was paralysed, but if you go up to them and say, they're coughing up the blood, and you say, so if you go to somebody who's with, with an anchor associated vasculitis with DAH, you say, how do you feel? They say, I feel rubbish. And they're all, you know, they're all clapped out, and they've been febrile and just fatigued for, for months. If you go out to somebody with anti-GBM disease and you say, if it wasn't for the blood and the shortness of breath, how would you be there? I feel fine. And that's because it's not a vasculitis. It's just specific antibodies attacking the basement membrane. So everything else is fine. It's just the basement membrane, which is gone. And that was, went with a, a complete absence of any systemic features. So we gave her standard induction therapy for good pastures, which is the same as um, standard induction for an AAV-associated um, DAH, which, again, is three grams of methylpred. Uh, dropping down to one, one milligram per kilogram, then plex until they stop bleeding. Important to use optoplas. A lot of people say, oh, plex them and replace them with albumin and then check the clotting. If you do that, you will check the clotting. The clotting will have come back as being abnormal because you've got rid of all your clotting factors, and by then you'll be sitting on a more alveolar hemorrhage. And you know, that, That's not the way to play it. It is expensive, though. Um, and then rituximab. And, uh, and she got better. This is two days into IV methylprednisone and Plex. And we thought, ah, oh, excellent. So here she is coming in with a CRP of 100. And this, again, is point of maximum happiness. 
So we're, we're sort of four or five days in, her CRP's down. We're saying, okay, she's going to come off ECMO soon, and, 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 and aren't we very clever? But then, this is day five, this is on the Friday. I remember going in there, and her CRP was up. She was tachycardic. She had more blood up the tube, and she was replicating HSV in her, in her bowel and her blood. And you know you get that horrible feeling in the in your pit of your stomach when you think, oh, God, she's 22, and I may have just made this all up, and it's all going horribly wrong. Um, uh, uh, and she had this new infiltrate down here. Um, and that, this is, I think, the importance of having a rheumatologist. And we've got a very good rheumatologist. You, you don't need any sort of rheumatologist. You need somebody who's, who's happy with sort of complicated pulmonary disease, happy with ILD and obscure manifestations of interstitial lung disease, happy with severe respiratory failure, happy to treat people on ECMO, and happy to, to if necessary, go in with reasonably heavy immunosuppression in difficult environments. And we have one, and she's called Dr. Agol. And this didn't phase her at all. And she did this, and I think this is one of the most, I think this is one of those beautiful pieces of immunosuppression and, and moving with, 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 with the way the patient is moving. So she stopped her plex. She thought, well, you know, she's got she's replicating HSV. We can't keep on with a plex. And she kept going with the prednisolone at one milligram per kilogram. She didn't want the disease to come back. And went in with some high dose isoc isoclavir. And then, when they, and then this is the IVIG. So the IVIG she bought on a basis of um, treating the HSV, but she's using it at an immunosuppressant dose, A, to help with the HSV, but B, to keep the, uh, the disease at bay, because IVIG is both good for infection and good for, it's a sort of a stop gap immunosuppressant, uh, as you probably know, if, if, you're, if you've got infection but you still want to control the underlying disease. Um, and uh, again, she did, she did remarkably well. Here she is, she, um, CRP came down. We could then reinstitute her, oh, they, well, then we could give her rituximab. Um, and here she is, uh, uh, 21 days after admission uh, to us. Uh, and here she is four weeks after discharge and she's back to normal. And um, we've, 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 we've given her four pulses of uh, uh, rituximab, and then we just left her. And like a, and like a good pastures, she's, um, I think she's going to be okay. Because good pastures is, 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 a, is, a, is almost a one-off disease, unlike the AAVs. So, and then there's this. And I, I don't really understand what this is. I understand what this is, the first bit of it is. So this is a 32-year-old. A, a, a uh, she's a, a lawyer. And she presents with a catastrophic um, presentation of fever, sweats, noradrenaline, and vasopressin-dependent shock. Uh, and uh, she's growing in pneumococcus in all her blood cultures. And she's got a right upper lobe pneumonia, right lower lobe pneumonia, pneumonia over here. And you can see this bulging fissure. Um, and this is um, three hours later. So it's gone to involve the whole of the right lung and the left lung. And here she is at five in the morning the next day when she, again, she's at ECMO dependent. An interesting thing with her, or one of the interesting things about her, she's very interesting overall, is that you can see this black bit of lung in here. And that's, uh, I think, gangrenous lung. So her right upper lobe is gangrenous. Her right lower lobe is, is gangrenous. Uh, and I said she was growing um, uh, pneumococcus, so she got treated for that. And you can see her pneumococcus goes away uh, and her procalcitonin drops. But she's left with this very inflammatory state. Um, and the reason for that was this. So the gangrenous bits of lung have now all become necrotic. And, and if you look down, as we did, there's lots of black necrotic lungs sloshing around, and with lots, presumably, of anaerobes, sloshing around, infecting both sides. So we, we sort of dealt with that with that drain. And, uh, and we got rid of this infla inflammatory state, which was, I think, because you had sloshing dead stuff lying around, an undrained cavity. And then we were left with this. And this went on for about a month and a half. All this is on ECMO. And she just never got off ECMO. And she was always persistently inflamed with the CRP, which just would not go away. And with that, up pops these eosinophils. And initially we said, oh, you know, it's probably the TAS, or it's probably this, or it's probably that, and they'll go away. But they just didn't go away. They just, they, 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 they just stayed here. So here's CRP, and here's eosinophils. And there was much of umming and ahhing, like, should we give some steroids, or should we not give some steroids? But nobody could really figure out a name for it to give it steroids. And especially you have all that pipe working, and we knew that it started off as a pneumococcal disease. Um, but she was stuck on ECMO, and she was completely ECMO dependent, and she had been now for three months, with a month of 
this, this having sorted out the collection. So we just said it's inflammatory uh, and gave you some methylprednisolone. And we sort of came up with this post mnemonic AEP idea. Um, anyway, it was dramatic, okay? It, it, it was dramatic. So here is cinephils, and they just, they just fall away just instantly, as, as you'd expect with methylpred, and you say, bloody, bloody. And then, this is when the methylpred went in, and you can see there is, you have to ignore this bit, okay? This was a sort of four or five days of meropenin deficiency. Um, but if, once that was corrected, uh, it, it, there is an exponential decay in her CRP, and that's related to the PRED. And, and here she is, okay? So these are days, 16, 17, 18th of January, 1990. The, the methyl PRED went in around about 22nd, and here are her sweet flows, okay? And they go five, 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 it's five liters a minute, five liters a minute, six liters a minute, in goes the methyl PRED, and the sweet flows go five, four, three, one, zero, 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 off ECMO. And, 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 she's, and she's better. And this is her coming into clinic. And I'm not, I'm not sure what that is. Um, but we've seen it before. We've seen this sort of persistent stuck on ECMO with an eosinophilia in H1N1, uh, in one case where there was an NG tube associated abscess with a, with a nasty ARDS. You get rid of everything else, and you say, well, why aren't you getting better? And you're stuck. There's an eosinophilia. Uh, they all got stuck, and they all got better with intravenous methylprednisolone. And I suppose the more I see of people being brought in, the more, more, more I know that there are a lot of unknown unknowns out there. And, you know, <laughs> inflammatory lung disease, some of them are described, but there's a lot which is not described. And then, lastly, uh, just so that sometimes it can get nasty, this is a 33-year-old um, with known U1RMP positive MCTD. So this is, MCTD is just a combination of systemic sclerosis and myositis. And she's been previously treated with IV methylprednisolone when she presented with a myositis and a bit of a cough. And she was on maintenance of 150 vasothioprine and four of PRED. She got pregnant. Oh, this is her, her initial CT, probably normal. Uh, she got pregnant, and then at 28 weeks, she went yellow. Uh, uh, it started itching, and they thought she had cholestasis of pregnancy. Stuck her on to rifampicin, which caused a second-line treatment, which also chews up steroids. And then two weeks later, she gets admitted at 30 weeks, weak, shortness of breath, cough, CK up, just like her initial presentation. But now she was low platelets and elevated liver enzymes. Her CT was a little bit abnormal. So they thought, well, this is a flare of the MCTD. It's exactly the way she presented to begin with. Uh, is it help? Is it something else? They thought, oh, well, we'll mature the baby and we'll give her 500 milligrams of IV methylprednisolone. And she promptly went to the septic shop, uh, had a, uh, a cesarean section, and then she just started hosing blood up the ET tube, went to ICU with that picture. Um, and she had a lot of blood, blood coming up the tube that would do for alveolar hemorrhage. They thought she had ongoing pulmonary hemorrhage, thought to be secondary to pulmonary vasculitis. They, in they went with methylprednisolone and two cycles of Plex. But she didn't get better. She got worse. She became ethno-dependent, unventilatable. She was bleeding from everywhere with platelets of three and came over on ECMO, uh, uh, completely ECMO-dependent. Um, with The only clue here is that it does spare the edges, but this is all alveolar hemorrhage. Um, so I think she probably did have alveolar hemorrhage, but you don't really get alveolar hemorrhage related to pulmonary vasculitis in MCTD. It doesn't happen. Um, and this is the clue. Here's a CMV viral load at 24 million. That's the highest we've ever recorded. Um, and we stopped all her immunosuppression. We gave her some IVIG and antivirals, and she went from that to better. And she had to have a lot of her gut cut out, and it was a very, very long story. And it's a great credit, I think, to the St. Thomas's ICU that they kept her alive. Unfortunately, she then uh, 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 was repatriated and died of, a, of, a, of another complication. And it's a long story cut short, but it's something which I've learned, immunosuppressing people, is if, you, if there's any hint of previous immunosuppression and you've got infiltrates and you don't know what's going on, you just got to check the CMV viral load because it'll come and bite you. If you don't get the CMV viral load, it'll come and bite you. And I've been bitten. And, I, and so that's something which I, I remember. And, it, and it's just also, sometimes it, it can be a bit difficult. And methylprednisolone and the immune are not without its risks. So, in summary, not all pneumonia and ARDS is such. And if you don't treat the underlying cause, they will die because that stuff needs to be treated. And then there will just be another pneumonia and ARDS death. And the key is to tease out that those who will respond to immunosuppress them and then immunosuppress them early and adequately without missing underlying infection. 
I think it's important to have that constant state of low-grade anxiety and always check the CMV viral load. And, you know, I look at this from outside, your sort of steroids and ARDS debate, and I just think this is not a homogenous disease. And there's a lot of stuff buried in there, which if you unpick it, you can define as other diseases. And I'm sure there's a lot of other stuff in there, which even if you unpick it, hasn't got a name yet, yet. Um, and uh, the acknowledgements of everybody in the team. This is Dr. Agarwal, my rheumatologist. Where's Luigi? There he is. Uh, and everybody else. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Mm.